Greetings, everyone. My name is Peter Young, and I'm a member of the Committee 100 and chairman of the Asian American Career Ceilings uh, Initiative at the Committee 100. And I really want to welcome you all to this uh, wonderful session on really a very important topic. I think it's an important topic generally, but in years like election years and so forth, the role of uh, you know broadcast news becomes even more important than it than it normally is. And we're very very privileged to have Richard Louie, who is a well-known journalist and news anchor. He's with uh, MSNBC and NBC News and has had a very uh, distinguished career you know, in the profession, although he did a whole lot of corporate stuff before, right, as well. So that, that it's, it's not typical of people who are in the broadcast journalism. Why is this topic important? It's important because in general, the career ceilings problem for Asian Americans exists across many, many industries, and broadcast news is on the list as well. But I, I am particularly concerned about the career ceilings in broadcast news because broadcast news has a very special relationship with the general population. It's really the face of, of, uh, of news, et cetera. And a lot of people judge how important different ethnic groups or genders are based on who they see. And, in positions of, of responsibility. And I think the broadcast news is a profession that has a special place as being uh, one that has a role of being kind of the face and, 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 and a voice of responsibility. Uh, I'm particularly pleased that we are able to do uh, the broadcast news with Richard Louis today. I'm very good at not reading everyone's bio from the invitation, but uh, as you see from his biography, he's done quite well. And also, he's had a very interesting career, both in broadcast, but also in corporations. Before we start, I just want to say that this is the 34th event that the Committee 100 has held under the uh, Asian American Career Ceilings umbrella. And most have been webcast, but some have been gatherings where we get leaders together to brainstorm and create new ideas on how to solve the problem. So, uh, Richard, you know, I have a list of questions that we talked about. It's also on the invitation. And we always like to start out, because it's very important, just asking the, the speaker about their career and how the position, they got to the position they hold today. And oh, by the way, for the audience, at the end, we'll leave 10 minutes for questions. And all you have to do is just type them into the chat box or the Q&A box. And both Richard and I will be able to see your question. And, and we'll try to address as many as, as we can in the time frame. But we will end promptly uh, in one hour uh, to be respectful to both the speaker and to the audience. So, Richard, if you could start out, talk about your career, how you ended up where you were. Were you always dreaming to be a, broad, a, a news anchor when you were in kindergarten? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a long time ago. Peter, first of all, thank you for convening uh, the 34th time. and. You look great. You don't look a, you don't look a day over 27. Uh, so well done. I know you're, you're as a 34th time, and, you know, this, these conversations are not easy to have. And, you know, we do our best to be as honest and straightforward and productive as well. Right. We, we, we need to be productive about this. I'm hoping that you will ask all the questions that you think are unsavory and that you shouldn't ask. Please ask them. All of them I want to talk about. And I know you are knowing if you know Peter, he's not going to shy away from any of those. But I just want to say that out that loud. Defi that's definitely correct, Richard. <laughs> that that is definitely definitely true. And clearly, uh, Peter does leisure better than I do, as you can tell, because uh, he has uh, got, got got that great tan and has been been out enjoying our great world. You know, to to get to this point, as you probably know the answer in our discussions in the past year, Peter, I had zero indications that I would ever want to do this as a young person necessarily. You know, I mean, like when I was, as you were saying, elementary, middle school, high school, this was not something I, I necessarily considered even as a, I actually thought I needed to be an engineer because all my other cousins were engineers uh, and lawyers. I really did want to do that. Uh, I didn't know what, whether it fit my type of family or others. I just wanted to do that. I didn't become an anchor until my mid thirties. And before that, as you were indicating, uh, my career was in startups and tech, uh, and then in Citibank, and then launching uh, the first ever fintech 
bank centric payment model that we patented back in 2001. And it was the first of its type. And in fact, it was, it was, I believe, and of course I have a little bit of bias here, Peter, I do believe it was the archetype for the way the digital payment FinTech um, uh, models that have since blossomed from that have been based upon just, you know, and I, I say that because the number of calls and you know how this works, the number of calls that were saying, we're, we want to talk to you because we know you have a patent on this process. Mm -hmm. And the number of calls that you get from perspectives, if you will, saying we're kind of interested in your patent tells you that there was a lot of interest in the payment flow that we had established in 01. Unfortunately, there was something called the dot-com bust, which completely destroyed the entire uh, banking market at the time. Um, to be very straightforward about it, um, it, I fell into this career. Um, after we sold our business in 2003, um, I then had transitioned and kind of asked my, 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 myself, you know, uh, I could go to the typical post MBA because I'd done my MBA at Ross and I'd finished it before we went to launch this carve out out of Citibank. And uh, we lucked out because Citibank gave us 51%, um, which, as you know, banks don't give 51% to uh, even their, their children. Um, so we, we felt very, very lucky. And that's when I had decided I'm going to not go back to strategy consulting and instead move into journalism. Now, why I got there and how I got there is a much lo longer supposition, which we can dig into, but that's kind of the mechanics of what happened and the timeline of, of what happened. Did you have anyone who kind of persuaded you to do it? Or was it just, you know, you, you identified as something you wanted to do? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, the process that I, so I wanted to be um, Tom Brokaw and Peter Jennings in terms of who I looked up to. Oh, but you're much better looking than both of them. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I don't have that much money to give you, Peter. I uh, don't have that much money. Really don't. You know, you do. I mean, uh, but uh, what happened was when I had the inkling that I wanted to go to journalism. And look, I had I, I had done a high school newspaper, uh, a newsletter at my church camp uh, every summer. Uh, the second journalistic experience is when I was at Berkeley, I did uh, radio news. Uh, they say, you know, I don't know if there's a saying we have in, in news that you have the face for radio. Uh, and I guess I had the face for radio. So I did radio news uh, when I was in, in college and I covered the first woman to be elected from the state of California to the U.S. Senate. Diane Feinstein covered her years later. And I've interviewed her since in my in my job as a as a journalist today full time, and covered Rodney King uh, as a as a college journalist as well. And then I left that and I did all of the tech and 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 business school and and Citibank thing. And then I came back to it. So you kind of see the three dots. Oh, okay, right? so you so actually got high a little bit of flavor initially, right? Yeah, just a little bit in high school, a little bit in college, and then I stopped. And then years later, it came, but it, it never was like, oh, I might do this full time right. until I did it full time. Yeah. But before I went into it, I went to the Asian American Journalist Association convention in 2004. And I was, I asked, uh, I flew in from Singapore because I was there with Citibank. I flew in from Singapore, went to the convention in Washington, D.C. We do it every election year. Uh, the, something called Unity, where you have the Black journalists, the Latino journalists, the API journalists, the LGBTQ plus journalists, uh, all gather at the same time, called Unity. We, do it every, we used to do it every election cycle. And that's when the GOP, as well as the Democratic um, candidates would come to speak to us because they're, you know, it's right in the summer before the election, they would address the largest convention of journalists, which was this unity. And I went there, Peter, and I, I was asking, are there other API men who are national anchors? And I was looking to, to, to look for, you know, just like we always do, right? When we're thinking of a new career, we go to see who's there and, and what you can learn from them to give you advice. There were none. And so I did speak with 
uh, former CNN anchors as well as uh, as well as uh, current large market anchors like uh, David Ono, who are Asian male. First of all, I learned two things. One, there weren't a lot of people that looked like you and me doing this job, right? There were nobody. There was nobody right, at that right. time uh, on the on the national level. Two, that we had a large community of Asian American journalists that I could lean back on, right? Because I already felt alone being out in Singapore and thinking of coming back to the U.S., my you know home country, to become a a national journalist. And I was worried I'd be doing it alone, but just seeing thousands, imagine close to 20,000 journalists of color gathering. And then you see at that time, about a thousand API journalists gathering at that DC conference. And that was comforting. So just like C100 gathers, and, and I know that you are chairing this year's convention and gathering in New York City, those gatherings are important because we, at that moment, for all of those who are coming for the first time and those who are returning for their fifth time or 10th time, we are reminded that we have comfort in seeing and knowing we will work together. Yeah. And that AAJA convention gave me the comfort to change careers from Citibank not going back to my strategy consulting job, not too far from where you and I sit here in New York, but instead becoming a journalist where I would make nothing compared to what I could have made otherwise. Yeah, so it, it wasn't for the big bucks. Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> no. yeah, yeah, no. yeah, absolutely. Well, the, yeah. the, the next thing I'd like to ask is this, you know, we've covered lots of different industries in this series, you know, everything from investment banking to arts and so forth. And although one thing is true, which is in every one of those industries, there's clearly some career ceilings problem, but it really varies. Sure. It really varies by industry, right? And strangely enough, there's mm -hmm. some that are surprising. You would think that technology wouldn't have a big problem, but in fact, it's one of the industries that it's a real problem in, in terms of career students for Asian Americans. To what extent that do you feel how severe or moderate or whatever do you think the problem is in terms of this career students for Asian Americans in broadcast news? Overall, very difficult for API men through the moon and beyond. Mm -hmm. It is that difficult. Or in terms of the height of the ceiling, it is already very, very low for APIs. Mm -hmm. For API men, it's about an inch off the ground. Each industry, the reasons for the ceiling can really vary. What do you think are some of the causes of this, this barrier in broadcast news? If you sat and spoke with me, Peter, 15 years ago and asked me that question, or even five years ago, well, six years ago, my answer would have been this. I break it down into supply and demand. Mm -hmm. And on the supply side, it's clearly low mm -hmm. in terms of APIs and, and the dynamic that they face. When it comes to API men, it is very low. The number of APIs and the national APIs on the national level is low they, for men and women. When it comes to, to men, it is even lower. Is it lower for men uh, than, than API women? Yes. So, so oh, just to give you an example. Because most industries yes, are the way around, right? Yes, most industries, that's correct. But in TV and, and broadcast news, which I'm glad you started by saying, look, it's it's overweighted. A person working in broadcast news and the way they're treated and, and uh, as well as their influence is overweighted compared to the commitment that others may make in the community and the fact they have in the community. It really is overweighted. But we are such visual beings that, that's the way it works, right? We see TV and that's, that must mean something. And, and the joke I often make is as soon as I started working at CNN and I was on air, all of a sudden I got asked to be a speaker and a moderator and keynote and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, I am no smarter than I was before in my new job. In fact, I may be dumber, <laughs> but why are people? And again, it's our overweighting of what's on air. Now, to give you an example, and AAJA came out with a report called Snapshot of Asians on Air, 
2020, and it was an evaluation of those folks who are on air in 2021 in the top 20 markets in America. Mm -hmm. And coming out later this year is an evaluation. So one takeaway is compared to 2003, which is the last time we did a, 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 an evaluation, that number went up by 50%. So that's good, right? More faces yeah. that yeah. represent America. That Because we're already way per capita, we're underweighted. But what's coming out later this year is, the, is a look at what it means by gender, because I didn't know that me being that gender would would be such an issue for me getting into broadcast news. But it is when it comes to this is preliminary data, so it may change when it is finally released. But if you look at the top 20 markets in America, three out of 10 are male, there's APIs. And seven out of 10 are women. Then overall, we're underweighted in the top, in, in most top, I don't have the full data yet, but we are underweighted in the, the markets where we have strong API communities, which in the top 20 markets, you can probably imagine there's a good yeah, representation yeah. of APIs. And we are underrepresented in just about all of them based on our on our population. So that is, you said, really, is it different? Yeah, it is the opposite in this industry for, for men and women. What, what are kind of the, the drivers, do you think? I mean, is there, there are yep. a lot of reasons why there could be a career ceiling, some of which are yep. benign and some of which are, are, are malignant, right? And, uh, you know, outright discrimination would be on the line. Benign might be just they hadn't thought about it, right? You know what I mean? Peter, it is clearly a cultural, subliminal, fundamental undercurrent that none of us talk about, but not because we're avoiding it. Sometimes we do, but it's just part of the culture. So when one person is chosen over another, it sometimes is a conscious decision. Sometimes it's not. So the realization of the over-sexualization of women, API women, and the emasculation or the effeminate approach to Asian men, as and, and what's different for Asian men is you're either seen as uh, emasculated or overly aggressive at the same time, by the way. And those two undercurrents that have been perpetuated in media and culture hurt men and women, but in different ways. And it also benefits in some ways too. So the, 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 the problem with API males in the broadcast industry, at least, is the long duck dong phenomenon. Yeah, The long duck dong in 16 candles, which goes back to the 80s, showed this very emasculated caricature of an API male or a, a man of Asian descent. And that has been perpetuated for a hundred years since we we had movies. Yeah. It's been that way forever. And on the flip side, you have the perpetuation of the angry uh, male figure in families of API men. So those two things, as you know, with all stereotypes, they're stereotypes. But when it comes to the decision and then the view, culturally, do you want to see that on TV? Yeah, right. And the answer is no. The answer is really no. So, it, it, especially in broadcast news, you don't want somebody who is weak, and you don't want to see somebody who's overly strong. So it just doesn't work. That's my supposition. And to get down to what you may want to ask or may ask, you know, the bottom line is here, Peter. I know my agent does not get the call. Hey. We need an API mail for my show <laughs> that's launching in six months. Do you have one? Oh, and they say, oh, by the way, Did we want one who is not effeminate and is not aggressive, right? <laughs> that's right. But they won't say that like that, that, and you know, I'm, I'm getting real. I'm really getting, real. but my approach for those, for those that know me is I, I don't walk around with a, a chip on my shoulder. This is market-based supply and right. demand. So uh, until five years ago, I would have told you, I don't know the answer. 
I now believe with 80% confidence and looking at the data now, that has gone up because we're looking at the data, AJA. I'm even more confident that we do have a cultural gap in understanding API male broadcasters. We also have a cultural gap when it comes to API female broadcast, but I wanted to express yeah. at least what I am because I know you're asking me specifically in my experience. Yeah, no, actually it's very interesting because unlike a lot of the other industries that we have covered, uh, it, 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 you're basically saying because it's a physical presence, right? You know, uh, if you're an investment banker, you may or may not see the person on the phone that you're talking to who's going to do your financing. But it's so, the physical stereotype is so prominent in broadcast. So that's interesting that it, in a sad way, you know, favors Asian women and in a sad way, you know, discriminates against well, men. I, I wouldn't say it favors women, but what I will say is in the oppression Olympics, Peter, yeah. right? If it's twice as difficult, and this is just a, this is just an analogy. If it is twice as difficult being an Asian woman in broadcast news, then it, than normal. If it's twice as difficult for them, then it's going to be three, four, five, or six times as difficult than the mainstream for Asian Asian male broadcasters. So this is not the oppression Olympics, but it's already twice as difficult, for instance, for API women, but it's going to be three, four, five, six, and seven times more difficult than the mainstream for API males. But we're not here for oppression Olympics. It's difficult for all APIs in general. Yeah. But when it, but that call, like, I know that's never happened for, to my agent. He has never gotten that call. I'm looking for, I need an API mail for my show. That's not true. So we have a demand problem and we also have a supply yeah. opportunity, but it's a bigger demand problem than it is a supply problem. I'll tell you that. So it's interesting. So actually, you know, there are actually some industries where being Asian in certain circumstance, you're favored. And for example, for many years in investment banking or in industry, if someone, they needed someone to go over to the Shanghai office or the, you know, Asian investment banking, you got the call, but sadly mm -hmm. you get pigeonholed, right? And then you can, you, you get pigeonholed yes. as the Asian market guy and then you have trouble getting back to the headquarters and succeeding so but it sounds like in broadcast news that's just not the case you know that they're not going to give you the call because they say oh we have a story in shanghai you know you're you're asian you know you're it right well you know that's where it gets the the shades of gray start to uh, arrive there there was a time and I, you should talk with tihua chang who you know um who's a, a veteran journalist with he debated that with his news directors and with in his career about that question. So if it's a Chinatown story, do you send the, the Asian person to go, right? And uh, the bottom line was when it comes down to storytelling, who is the best? Sometimes it will be the person that is of community because they can get in there. Sometimes it's not. So my boss, Yvette Miley, was, who's been a, is a, is a seasoned uh, journalist and news director, sent me to Rod, not to Rodney King, but to Michael Brown um, and Freddie Gray. And, you know, she sent me in there in communities that potentially had a black API conflict. And when I got there, the reality was there was not the, the conflict people made it out to be similar to the last five years. They say the conflicts there. I was like, hang on a second. I've been through this through a lot of communities. I get there and guess what? In fact, we understand each other very quickly on the ground where a lot of the black community members would say, Richard, it's great to see you. We are so glad you're here. You get it. Right. And so um, there are some things about where is it the best to send a, a Latino reporter into a Latino community? Sometimes, yeah. sometimes not. Yeah, exactly. And there, there was no hard and fast rule before. Yes. T. Hua Chang would probably tell you when if it came to a, an, an, an API story, he would get the call more often than not. And I'll tell you one of the changes. 
in the last five years, the when I was anchoring, I would do a bunch of panels. And if it had to do with API politics, you know, I knew who to call any of the faces that were API politicians that were consultants, and they would talk about the API community. It was a hate crime, APIs. Yeah. That was part of the, the challenge was to, is that the only time you saw APIs on TV or majority of the time right. would be when it had to do about APIs. And what I saw in the last five years, and I had a couple of panels where I was talking about the election, not related to um, uh, identity, not related to ethnic background, or or the, the changing of the guard or a lawsuit on, at the presidential level, blah, 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 you know, during the Mueller case, you know, I had panels of all APIs and we didn't bring up the word API once. Yeah. So yeah. It was me and four other panelists and we're just going, I'm not an opinion journalist. I do not hold an opinion when I'm asking questions. Right. I, I guard that. Of course, does it come through sometimes just people being people were not perfect, but my goal is not to hold an opinion. And so when we would do these nonpartisan panels, which are always my panels, uh, excuse me, that's always the type of panel I would like to have. When we would talk about topics to have four others, again, being, they may be opinion, but I prefer journalists to see those five faces on that five box, which, you know, using one, two, yeah, yeah, three, right. four, five, all APIs, Peter. I had never seen that before. And a couple of times I had to post and I had said, I, I think we've just made history. <laughs> I, we, we had five API faces and we were not talking about API issues. And that happened two or three times. Yeah, yeah. So we, we're in a different space. Now, in your career, you know, obviously you have succeeded because you're an anchor and so forth. So you didn't have a fatal, you know, career ceiling problem. But Along the way, do you are there some experiences that you can cite that in fact did slow you down that you perceive it slowed you down because of your ethnicity? Uh, and the other is, have you observed that in the careers of because you know so many of your colleagues, right, who are AAPI in broadcast news? Have you seen other examples where you said, you know, something they really put the brakes on in that case on on his career? I've worked for three networks over the last 20 years. And I would say that I have seen others being talked about in stereotypical ways that I did not appreciate. And I wish I had stood up. And because I didn't feel I had the voice yet. And then I also worried for my own, my own career safety, if you will. And over the last 20 years in those three network jobs, I wish I I had. that. I can put it on two or three fingers when I actually heard those out loud. Mm -hmm. And they weren't derogatory. They were subliminal. And so I, I wish I would have said something. I am very clear right now, as you can tell. Mm -hmm. I'm saying things now that Typically, they're not easy to say. Right, right. But what I am saying is, when I say supply and demand problem, when I say that I have my agents never gotten that call, we need an API mail. I'm telling you right now, Peter, that I just answered your question, right? I've gone through it. I've seen others go through it too. Yeah. How do you think... Um we can fix this problem as individuals in, in the profession, your profession, but also more from a system or societal point of view, right? I mean, an example being, you know, if, if you have a career ceiling in corporate America, there are things you can do individually to, to, to fix the problem. Yes. But also there are things that companies are being encouraged to do with, you know, in terms of. Yes. DI programs or explicit programs to add people yes. to boards and so forth. So in those two categories, what do you think are some of the fixes that we should try to implement? You know, the first thing is we need to support our NGOs and CBOs in the space. 
So as a community, leaning in on our journalistic organizations related to our community to give them the, so it's, it's the, the legs on the stool of power basically here, Peter, which is, is sort of 101 is what we should be doing. And so I'll start with the media space. And so like the Asian American Journalists Association, there is also the South Asian Association. There's a media which focuses on the Middle Eastern uh, and North African space journalists. Uh, when we lean in, and I'm only, I know the others from the other groups, but since we're talking about AAPIs here, that giving them the power and supporting them, so because they're the ones that keep their ears to the ground. Right. They're the ones that are the not only the the builders of new journalists that look like you and me, right? That they train them. They have the conventions that say, "Yeah, you're you're okay." Like the one I went to oh, in 2004, yeah. right? And that's why I said I can go. And you know that sometimes it's that one call, that one convention, that one lunch, that one sighting on air that makes a difference for somebody right? that they decide to come in. So if you have the money and or the time, it is to give to those organizations because they need it. And they know this space. Like AJA has been around for almost full five decades. They're in their fifth decade right now. And it started in Los Angeles with a API journalists who said, we need to be represented during Vincent Chin. They're like, we got issues. Yeah, Our story is not being told. And so that would be the first step. The second step is to more broadly invest in the other cultural API spaces mm -hmm. because this is a culture gap that is as wide as the Grand Canyon. There is what we are and what the perceptions of what we are. And the perceptions, unfortunately, as I was mentioning earlier, harken back half a century to a full century. Yeah. By the way, I... I, I got to meet the president, the current president of the, you know, Asian American Journalists uh, Association. Nicole Dunka. Yeah, New, Nicole Dunka. And, you know, boy, I didn't appreciate the long history that that association has had and the things that, that it does. But that's really, that is one element that's very important to making, it is very important. making, and making progress. Um, but also, I think, as you say, you know, you, you, you got to reach out to other groups as well. Um, by the way, it's very interesting. You know, we had one, we had one on uh, television and, and movies. And one of our co-committee 100 members, Janet Yang, who yes. was famous for the Joy Lack Club and everything. But then yes, she's she's amazing, now, right? she's the president of the Screen Actors Guild. She was a speaker. And, you know, I think one of the things she said was very interesting. She said, you know, that um, part of the evolution. She runs it. You mean she runs the academy, Peter? Well, the academy, exactly. Uh, yeah, the right. academy. I'm sorry. And uh, that that has that little show once a year, the Oscars, right? But we the, don't even know what it is, right? You yeah. don't even know what it is, right? <laughs> but she had an interesting observation. She said, "Whenever you have something that is consumer facing, uh, facing, a lot of it is an is a, it's a harder thing because." a lot of the producers so forth are sort of fixated on what consumers are used to. And she pointed out the fact that for a long time, the only TV shows were specific just for Asians, you know, that were comedy shows that were just Asian families or whatever. And that was helpful. But then, you know, it, moving into where you had Asian Americans and moving into roles that were not for Asian Americans, right? But were just characters in a show that started to educate and they did well that started to educate the producers etc that in fact it's quite acceptable to cast asian americans in roles that are not quote you know just the you know token asian american the asian american person on, you know on the screen you know and we'd all start out very sadly you as we all know where bruce lee came out with the uh you know, the concept of um, 
what's the show, you know, and David Carradine, you know, got, mm-hmm. got, got put in that role instead of him. And, you know, that was a sad part of the uh, TV history. So is that, is that also a part of an element for broadcast news? In other words, kind of the perception of acceptability with the audience? Because that certainly is true for TV. Yeah. Uh, I just brought up the, the note of, based on the census numbers for the top 20 markets in America, whether we had a, a commensurate representation on air of AAPIs. Look, I understand the criticism. We shouldn't be doing head counts based on your, your color of your skin in an ideal world. Mm-hmm. But we do have, you're describing two dynamics. One where we got to watch the per capita and have a match. The other dynamic is, wouldn't it be great if we were just selected based on our talent? Yeah. Right? The issue is we're not being selected based on our talent. Right. That's what I'm saying, right? That's not happening. And it's not because of conscious decisions. I think the majority of it is in the back of our mind. We don't realize why we're making decisions. And so the way that most news organizations function is it's not. So when you go through uh, consulting interviews, for those of you who have done strategy consulting and management consulting or law, which Peter, you, it is such a structure. It's not perfect. It's not perfect, but it is certainly a structured, the way you interview, the way you're, the way you communicate those interviews and the way your the assessment happens. And it's not done by one or two. It's done by this huge system. Your pay is, is, is very transparent in terms of where you start and where you go. That is not the way it works in, in, in news. You're not going to be laid out first year, second year, third year, fourth year pay rates and a potential bonus ranges. You don't get, there's no such thing as that. That's right. And so, so the lack of transparency is the way the business works. So, you know, me coming from uh, Citibank and, and, and then from strategy consulting, I was used to like seeing, okay, here's the slide with the payment bands and this is the potential bonus and this is where you're going to go. And, you, at least you knew the ranges you were in when it comes to broadcast news. Oh, no, no, no. There is no such piece of information. You go, you run through that door and then you kind of guess where you might be Yeah. for the most part. There's, there's no slide that anybody has ever put up that has that information where in law firms and in, stre- in consulting and in banking and all of these other spaces, yeah, they're met, they're met. there is a sl- yeah, there's a slide. Yeah. So one one of the problems I guess I'm telling you is the lack of standardized biz, business processes. But that's the way the industry works, right? And not every industry needs to be like other industries. But I'm saying in terms of if you're used to what we're talking about, about banking, right, consulting, law, all of those things, if you were to jump over to broadcast news, none of those sort of uh, compensation slides and track that you have there do not happen over here. And that, 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 that is indicative of the market. The market is uh, subjective and objective in in, in a different mix. But it's not the only industry that that's very subjective. There are many, many others, but I have a, a, a kind of a related question, which is, uh, one of the things that's come out in 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 the webcast we've done for journalism and so forth, uh-huh. one of the issues is uh, major markets versus you know regional markets, so forth. Is there any difference that you perceive if you happen to try to be uh, you know you know uh, uh, on the news in Waltham, Massachusetts versus New York City or whatever? Is there a different dynamic in terms of this career ceiling issue or not? You know, I don't know the answer. I'm just asking because it, it, it is yeah. some other, uh, uh, some other media type industry. Right. Right. Now, again, as I was telling you about it at AJ compiled, uh, and as we look at it, the reporter on the reporter set, it's a less that the, the, the ceiling is a little higher. Mm-hmm on the anchor seat it is very, very low. 
Mm -hmm. It is it is very difficult to break through for APIs in the anchor seat in in smaller markets, generally speaking. Um, on the bigger markets and those with more APIs, which you'll see in California, is you there'll be a, a much larger number that are on, in the anchor seat that are API. Yeah. So to answer your question very, very clearly, it is difficult in general, but on the reporter level in smaller markets, that's where it's, um, that's, that's where it's, it's more acute, but generally yeah, that's speaking. Interesting. That's interesting because that's sort of counterintuitive to the stereotypes where you say, well, if you're in, you know, smaller that you are, it might be easier. You're actually saying it's the opposite for Asian Americans. Yeah, in, in general, um, it it is just, it's difficult all the way around. But the anchor seat is where it gets extremely difficult in smaller markets. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you heard it here. Richard Louis says, start out in New York and L.A. Right to advance your career. Right. <laughs> I, I would say. <laughs> on a per capita on a per capita yield, you would expect that your yield would be um, I'm, I'm saying that your yield will be pretty much equal regardless of market size, yeah. which it, it shouldn't be. but um, now uh, we have a we have questions that are coming in. Uh, I have one question for you, which is, you know, we have a lot of people who are watching. And obviously, probably quite a few of them they're watching because they're in somehow entered the profession or they, they're thinking about entering the profession. So, you know, if you were sitting down with one of the members of the audience and they asked a question, what advice would you give to me, uh, you know, with regard to how to be successful broadcast news? What advice would you give them? I would say... Become involved in understanding the way the business works and engage in the team members in the organization across function. Our function as a broadcast journalist is to be broadcast journalists. Mm -hmm. But how is it that we come up with specials? Mm -hmm. How is it that we get the resources to the ground? How is it that we evaluate the audience? What are, what's the annual, how, you know, during sweeps, how do we come up with the numbers and where do they come from? How does the ad sales department work and who do they talk to? Mm -hmm. And it goes broader even in the broadcast, on the, on the on air stuff as well, you know, my beat, it might be, so if it's general, if you're a general assignment, then that's great because you're getting a wide selection. Um, sometimes you don't have a choice, you get a beat. But the idea is to understand all the beats. So if it's going to be consumer, if it's going to be city hall, if it's, you know, whatever the crime, is to understand more of the beats. Because when you get a broader understanding of what and how and why the decisions are being made on the business side, because that affects you, then you will be better positioned to make the better decisions to increase your longevity. If you so choose to increase your longevity, Yeah, that's you'll right. do better at that. You'll do better at that. One of the things that I do at work is I, I pitch stories all across different beats. And when I was asked at CNN whether I wanted to be a business or tech correspondent, I didn't want to be that. I came from business. I came from tech. And for me, I was like, I don't, I don't have any interest in it as a journalist. I have a lot of interest on the, on the general news space. And as an anchor, I should. But that was me. Right. I didn't I didn't want to do business. I didn't want to do tech because I felt like I, I got that. Right. I got that. There's nothing intriguing for me. But being on the anchor desk was intriguing to me. And I knew, Peter, that 
when I set out changing my career, and by the way, I had to write the largest check at that time that I'd ever written, 70,000 plus, to pay back my second year of business school to my consulting company because they they'd sponsored me for my oh I see business so school. you had to pay it back if you if you didn't stay with them and I and I didn't go back to them. they were the best they were the kindest they understood they waited they were this is during a recession they were waiting for me they could have cut me loose yeah and when when I decided I was going to become a journalist I was like sorry and, it'll, and like and it, I was talking to my fellow B school folk uh, friends. And they're like, don't do it, Richard. What are you doing? You have a job during this recession and, <laughs> you and you're going to become an, and you're going to be an anchor and, and make, um, what is it? Make a quarter of what you would make post MBA, right? You're going to do that. And on top of that, because I had to write that check for 70,000 and this is, this is in dollars 20 year more than 20 years ago. Yeah, so it was worth a lot more in today's dollars. Yeah, yeah, I, I tell you, I I remember calling my dad and said, "Guess what? I decided not to take the job, and I have to write this check, and I'm going to take this new job, which means I'm working for free the first two years of this, of this new job. I work for free. I work negative dollars. That if you just look at the first year, I, I work for negative dollars. But I had I had to take the swing." And um, I, I knew that I could always go back to strategy consulting. I, I wasn't worried like, oh, I'd forget how to do that, right? You don't forget how to do that. And if I didn't get the network job, because I said, the goal is if I do this, I must make it to network. Yeah. And the, the first job I did, the second one was at CNN. And when I got the call, I, you know, I totally screwed up the first uh, audition. That was, it's hilarious. But uh, I can tell you that story, but uh, that's, and, and it's okay. That, that was very good. It was a very good lesson. The, the, the big one here is um, I'm glad that I went for it. I'm also lucky that I could afford to do that. Yeah. Because a lot of people well, don't I'm, have I'm that sure, choice. I'm sure your father just jumped up with joy and so forth. Probably <laughs> He laughed. You, you pro no, he's probably similar to when my father who really, really wanted me to go to MIT and become a doctor or a scientist. When I told them I was going to go into business and go to Harvard Business School, there was the longest silence on the phone you can imagine. <laughs> you, you did okay. You did okay. Yeah, well, uh, but he, he thought I, he definitely thought I had totally failed, right? Uh, yeah. But uh, my dad laughed, actually. My dad laughed. Yeah. And he said, I always knew you were different. Yeah, yeah. Which I guess you said, well, I take that as a compliment, right? <laughs> oh, uh, you know, when my dad laughed, he I did not expect it, Peter, was, I guess it was what you're saying. But I, it, it was, you know, I was lucky to have parents that supported me no matter what the you crazy decided. decisions I made. Yeah. yeah, they, they, I'm number three of four, right? So the first two already beat them up. If you will, they 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 soften the ground for for me. So when I came oh. around, yeah, yeah. Well, by the way, the, the 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 after the moment of silence, my father did say the following, which then demonstrated he actually had done some reading about business. He says, "Well, at least I'll get a better return on my investment at Christmas time." <laughs> there you go. There you go. Now let's let's go. We have some uh, questions here, so I'm going to read sure. for the audience since they can't see them. One is from Kenson Ventures, which I assume is Ken Fong. And he says, hi, Richard, you can help fix the supply problem because once you get up there to be one of the top guns in the national broadcasting, you will automatically encourage more uh, young Asians to follow your foot list. Uh, let us know what we can do to help. So he's saying, what can they or, or us do to help in maybe you know working with you? Thanks, Ken. Uh, and he's right. Um, just as I looked at, uh, as I was saying either earlier, Peter Jennings, right? And um, Ted Koppel and all the rest, they're the ones I looked up to and partially the reason why I felt like it was doable. And then when I went to the AJ convention, I said, ah, I have a community that will support me. 
And I think the way we can do it, as I said earlier, is you can support the AJAs of the world. They need it. Um, you can also, I mean, having organizational support that's not necessarily, it's both a mix of carrot stick, by the way, uh, letting networks know that you're appreciative of seeing APIs on air. Um, that works. Organizational support um, letters do help. You know, um, they therefore they know that you're watching and that you care. Yeah. Some I think there's a there's there is this community, our community of APIs historically has not over the last fifty years stood up in an organized fashion to say. Hey, there are no, Karen Narasaki was the one who did it at Asian Americans Advancing Justice. And she did it for when she was leading um, Asian American AJC out of um, Washington, D.C. That's our civil rights, our national civil, yeah, civil right. rights organization. She was the one that led that for decades. And she did an amazing job because she let them know we're watching you and we care, right? We, and we support you. But because this is a partnership, sometimes you got some tough love, right? So I'm being very careful to say, you know, it would be great if the organizations of our community gave both the the the, the good love and the tough love to our news organizations. So be there in the good times, be there in the bad times, be there when they make good decisions, be there when they made the decisions that it could have been better. Yeah. That will also move the needle. Those are the two things I would suggest. Again, AJA and organizationally supporting our news organizations and all, at the same time, giving them the tough love when they need it. Yeah. So we have a question here from Matthew Asada. He said, I wanted to ask a question about your survey, quote, on air, uh, unquote, mm -hmm. and what type mm -hmm. of differences there are between TV, radio, and print for Asian American journalists and whether your survey is inclusive of East and South Asians. Yes, it is inclusive of East and South Asians, or what I call South and North Asians, because uh, if you have South and you have North, just like uh, the discussion in international politics and policy is the new South, the global South and the global North, right? Um, and it is inclusive of both of those groups, and they need to be, um, because in, in the United States, as you know very well, and what's the name again? It was Matthew Asada. Matthew, as you know very well, Matthew, uh, that is that is a challenge for us because we, according to the United Nations, when you say the word Asian American, or therefore you have the word Asia, and in the UN group, it's fifty-four countries that are in the in 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 that group, in the Asia group. So we've got a lot to bring in together in AJA. Uh, definitely focuses on the intersectionality. That report, which is called Snapshot uh, Asians on Air, you should be able to find that by just Googling it. And that was an evaluation of Asians on Air in the United States in the top 20 markets in 2021. The, 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 the update to it, which is coming out maybe later this week, later this year, we hope, will dive deeper into what I, some of the thematics that I've, I've just been talking about. Mm -hmm. um, now, in terms of the difference between on air versus print, I don't have that data. Yeah. I don't have that data. I will tell you that anecdotally and based on my 20 years in the business, it is even more dire when it comes to the behind the scenes producers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, it, it's already bad on air, but, you know, I, it is based on speaking with other AAJA members who are on air, finding your API producer is equal or more difficult to find. Yeah. And it's the producers that work to get and pitch the stories that get on air. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, anonymous attendee asks the following question. <laughs> you are one of the most presentable Asian Americans in national broadcasting. What do you consider as the reasons why the network or cable TVs have not given you, I guess you specifically, 
a more visible or key role in representing 25, 000, 25 million Asian American in our nation? Well, first of all, Anonymous, uh, can I quote you when I talk to my mom that I'm presentable? <laughs> <laughs> you, you can copy yes. this question, uh, you know, from the yeah. text box, uh, Richard, so you can get it exactly word by word. My, my mom is the most loving, funny person. She's very dry sense of humor. She might as well be Jewish. But, you know, she will always say to me, your hair's too high. It's too low. <laughs> um, did you sleep? You know, she's an elementary school teacher. Your subject verb agreements was bad on that sentence, Richard. And then she laughs because she doesn't. In other words, it's, it, my mom has never been. She's got this super dry sense of humor. But anonymous, thank you for saying that. My mom would, would love it. Um, why do I think, you know, for the dynamics I just suggested, that um, it, it's probably, you know, I don't have the data specifically for myself. Uh, I will only say that my network has been so gracious as I, I, which Peter, you know this, for the last eight years, I've been flying from uh, New York to California to take care of my dad who had Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm based in New York. And I remember again, that discussion sitting with Yvette Miley and I thought I was going to lose my job because, you know, we, we typically are expected to be on call every right. day, every hour of the week. And I used to relish that because Yvette would call me and say, Richard, I'm going to send you here to this story. I, you know, when I was in Paris, I was covering the Bataclan massacre. You know, I was, I would be on air for hours covering breaking news. And when I walked into Yvette's office, this is eight years or nine years ago now. And I said, my dad was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and I want to be there for him. Um, and I don't know how we're going to make this work, Yvette. And she said, I know how we're going to make it work. And I was like, what? Because I thought she was going to say, Richard, great, great guy. When you're done taking care of your dad, give me okay. a call right. and we'll see how things, yeah, then we'll, then we'll see how things are, which is, 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 is great by itself. Instead, she says, I'm taking care of my mom as well. And let's see how we can make it work for you. And that began my journey of working three days a week for the last now eight years. Now, my father passed two years ago, and now I'm helping to take care of my mom who has dementia and flying back. And I just came back this past week. She turned 90, and I have never ordered so much Chinese food in my life to bring over to the house because we had uh, people come over well, to visit her. 90, her is 90. Special, 90 is a special year. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. If I can make it uh, even close to that, I'll be glad. So, you know, there's some choices I made also in my career that means that I may not have all the other openings that I could have if I stayed in it. And I, without knowing the exact calculus to answer the question anonymous, I think I, I, I could be doing better, but it's, but I don't have all the variables in place, right? right. And it's, it's a very- hard in, to, It's ex hard to- it's hard to measure the reasons and see see the right. Mind. Yeah, I do know that they they have and were so generous to want to keep me around, um, to let me support my family. I will never forget that. Yeah. And um, even in the most what in the stereotypical most cutthroat cutthroat city and stereotypically the most cutthroat business here at 30 Rock, one might say stereotypically, I have found nothing but kindness. And I am grateful for that. Do I wish, yeah, you can you have your cake and eat it too in this dynamic? I don't think you really can. Yeah. It's it's because it's so demanding. So this is why I comment on the market overall. And for myself, you know, I, I, I would love to have a more prominent, and um, forward voice because I came here because I was very interested in our API community. I could have stayed at CNN Worldwide headquarters in Atlanta at the time and I had a great job, but I wanted to come to New York because I'd be able to go to DC because I was very interested in API politics. 
Judy Chu just had become the chair of KPAC, our Asian American Pacific Islander Caucus right. in the House. And I wanted to understand how we are doing in politics. Because I knew when it came to influence and recognition, it comes to the stool of power and the four legs. Two of those legs, one is politics, second is media. And of course, we have business as well. And then you have community. So this is why I came up to New York and why I chose to be here. And I have very few, if any, regrets that are even relevant. I can say almost no regrets about that decision. Yeah. So Anonymous, thank you for being aware of that. Well, we've come to the end of the hour. Uh, there are just two comments I want to make. Uh, first, uh, as Richard mentioned, uh, we have the Committee 100 Annual Conference in Gala. It's going to be on April 19th. Um, you know, we've done something very different this time, which was uh, we have three tracks. We have three general sessions, you know, where there's a there's a debate about will DEI suffer the same fate as affirmative action? Then we have uh, Scott Wong and Lan He uh, Chen talking about the uh, elections coming up as a general session. But the rest of them are three tracks. One is just on Asian American issues related to hate, Asian American hate, career ceilings, et cetera. The second one is on U.S.-China relations and cultural exchange, et cetera. And the third is a dedicated networking track where we have a room where if you just don't like any of the other two panels. You know, you could just go and network with people. We're very excited about it. But I point this out particularly, and then there's a gala where we're going to honor two prominent people for their contribution and have performers from Tianjin Juilliard. But I think this group should particularly at least look into attending because if you're interested in this issue, we have an entire track the whole day covering everything from, uh, you know, what progress are we making on uh, career ceilings to to what programs are in place in education to make have awareness of Asian Americans to the discrimination, you know, uh, that the current national defense policies have that may have a negative effect on Asian Americans, et cetera. So uh, just go to the website if you're you're interested, but I strongly encourage you to attend if you, you know, care about these uh, about about these issues. The last thing I want to say is, Richard, I, I like sometimes I like to end with a story. And the story is my wife was the chief trade negotiator for the U U.S. with China and Japan a number of years ago under Bush Sr. And, and, and Clinton. So we used to have to go back and forth on Amtrak, you know, every weekend, you know, we would take turns and taking Amtrak to D.C. and back. And one day I got on the train and I got on the quiet car and I said, this is great because I had some work to do and so forth. I hear this voice, this booming voice very loud, so forth, it was talking in the quiet car, right? And it turns out no one in the quiet car complained because it was Walter Cronkite. <laughs> and anyone who's ever watched CBS would know his voice is very distinctive. So everyone in the car, we had a silent pack that said, you know, if Walter Cronkite wants to talk to his wife in the quiet car, that's fine. <laughs> And then we all were respectful and said, you know, we're not all going to go up there and ask for his autograph. But uh, but uh, that was my story with uh, Walter Cronkite, who uh, clearly that voice was probably a big part of his success, right? Yeah, it was. Yes, for sure. So People Richard, are very audio. Yes. Yeah. So, Richard, I want to thank you so much for being, you know, the the being interviewed on this. I think the insights that you gave are very special and not the kind of thing you could just read by, you know, Googling or whatever. And uh, and in particular, their personal story about the choices you made along the life and and purposely made in life. And uh, so I want to thank you for that. And I want to thank those people in the audience for attending. Yes. I hope, I hope you found some of the comments and uh, that Richard made to be <laughs> useful to you. And, uh, you know, 
we look forward to seeing you frequently on TV, Richard. Thanks a lot, Peter. Thank you, everybody, for those of you who are still awake for uh, spending the time. <laughs> okay. Very good. Thank you all.